attack helicopters bridge the gap between armored vehicles and jet strike aircraft. They have greater mobility and speed than armored vehicles, but lack their armor protection. They are not as fast or powerful as strike aircraft, but their rotor propulsion allows them to be operated from the forward edge of the battlefield. The development of the attack helicopter began during the Vietnam War. Their UH-1 Hueys were rigged with machine guns and rocket launchers to escort troop-carrying helicopters into battle. Unfortunately, the Hueys' relatively slow speed and bulky design made them vulnerable to ground fire. By redesigning the fuselage and augmenting its firepower, its effectiveness in the attack role could be considerably increased. This led to the Cobra. The Cobra pioneered the classic attack helicopter design. In the forward cockpit is the co-pilot gunner, and in the rear cockpit is the pilot. This tandem configuration produces a sleeker fuselage than conventional transport helicopters, permitting greater speed and aerodynamic performance. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Iron Curtain, the Soviets began developing their own attack helicopter. The Mi-24 Hind. It was not only a formidable attack chopper, capable of 170 miles per hour, but also large enough to carry eight troops. It could even drop bombs, a unique ability even among the latest attack helicopters. After the Vietnam War, the development of guided missiles expanded the capabilities of attack helicopters, particularly for the United States. Fitted with anti-tank missiles such as the TOW missile, the Cobra helicopter could now take the lead in attacking enemy armored forces, especially in difficult terrain. As a result, tank hunting became one of their primary missions. If you're uh, advancing on an enemy with tanks and you run into a river, your progress basically stops unless you've got a, a, a river crossing operation ready to be implemented. With the attack helicopter, you don't need to worry about that and you're capable of going across the river and influencing the battle on the other side of that obstacle until such time as the ground forces can catch up with you. On the AH-1 Cobra, the tow wire-guided anti-tank missile is used. A very similar missile is the HOT. When fired, these missiles trail a very thin copper wire behind them. This amazingly tough wire serves as a link between the guidance system on the helicopter and the control surfaces on the missile. And by using a small control, the guidance system steers the missile precisely toward the target. The Sea Cobra is a marine variant of the AH-1 Cobra and forms the backbone of marine attack helicopter units. Due to the different environments from which they operate, the marine Cobras have different features from their army counterparts. One of the latest improvements in marine attack helicopters is the more powerful AH-1W Super Cobra. The Super Cobra can fire either the tow or the newer Hellfire anti-tank missile. Cobras saw widespread and varied use during Operation Desert Storm in 1991. They've also seen extensive combat in Afghanistan and Iraq. Combat helicopters are generally part of the Army rather than the Air Force. Logistically, this makes them particularly well suited to the dangerous mission of carrying out air support in close proximity to friendly forces. The U.S. Army's AH-64 Apache exemplifies this capability. The AH-64 is the ground commander's weapon. We're integrated into his plan in every way, shape, and form. We know how he thinks, 
we know how to anticipate where he will best employ us. You don't get that from a close air support aircraft showing up, reporting in on station, and then engaging targets. Having us immediately available gives you the 30-minute string, the on-call capability. Uh, it also gives you a great amount of flexibility. With this aircraft, you can conduct surveillance, reconnaissance, armed reconnaissance, uh, a variety of missions. You asked an Air Force pilot to do that, and I don't think you'd get that kind of support. The 1980s saw the deployment of a second generation of attack helicopters. The premier example of this new class is the Apache. The Apache was specially designed for combat on the modern battlefield. A new generation of weaponry, advanced sensors, and missile guidance gave the Apache unprecedented long-range firepower. The advantages of second-generation attack helicopters, such as the Apache, became obvious in the battles of the first Gulf War. Its capability to stand off outside the, the capability of the enemy to see us, number one, and number two, engage us, uh, is just phenomenal. In the case of the uh, Ramayo oil field battle, we started our initial engagements at uh, 6,700 meters out. Those forces never knew who was engaging them. And uh, by the time we took out our fifth or sixth uh, T-72 tank, they generally got the idea that that was not a good place to be and they left. At the center of the Apache's weapon systems is the Hellfire missile. The Hellfire is laser-guided rather than wire-guided. Older wire-guided missiles have a maximum range of about two miles due to the length of the wire that can be carried. The Hellfire's range is more than double that thanks to its unique guidance system. A laser designator mounted in the nose fires an invisible beam of intense light at the enemy target. The seeker in the head of the Hellfire zeroes in on the laser light being reflected off the target. This longer range is a critical advantage for attack helicopters. By striking from distances over five miles away, their vulnerability to enemy defenses is significantly reduced. The Hellfire missile, I give ranges out in excess of eight kilometers if I needed. Just like with any kind of a battlefield system, I want to use the weapon that keeps me as far away from the bad guy as possible. And if I can hit him at eight kilometers with my Hellfire, I can stop at eight kilometers. He can't even see me at eight kilometers. In addition to tanks, the Apache is designed to engage a variety of other targets. Under the nose of the helicopter is a 30 millimeter chain gun that can be used against lightly armored vehicles. On the stub wings are unguided rockets for attacking targets with high explosives. Helicopters are large and noisy. To minimize the visibility of the Apache to enemy forces, it was designed to operate at night. The two unusual devices on the nose of the Apache are the pilot's night vision system, or PINVIS, and the target acquisition and designation system, or TADS, used to locate targets and aim its weapons. The majority of the weapon systems are uh, sighted through the TADS system, which is mounted on the nose of the aircraft. Uh, that is basically controlled with the thumb force controller. The Hellfire missiles are sighted uh, through that uh, primarily either uh, with the laser designator through this aircraft or another aircraft. Both the nose mounted sensors contain forward looking infrared sights or FLIR. The supercooled sensor of the FLIR senses heat. It can detect a few degrees of temperature difference between objects, making it an ideal night sight. Flying an attack helicopter at high speeds and low altitude in a hostile environment is difficult and risky. 
To make it easier for the crew to handle all their tasks in such a fast-paced environment, special features were built into the Apache. One of the most remarkable of these is the crew's special helmet. This is called the IHADS Integrated Helmet and uh, Display System. It's a rather actually sophisticated and expensive piece of equipment that was developed in uh, concert with the Apache to uh, utilize some of the systems on the Apache, uh, mainly the pilot night vision system, uh, the 30 millimeter chain gun cannon, and the pads. Any of these systems can be slaved to the helmet. That you can take these systems and where the pilot is looking, make the weapon system and or sensor look. This is the HDU helmet display unit. This is uh, similar to what the Air Force has in the aircraft up on their uh, glare screen. It's, a, it's a, a HUD, heads up display unit, except this mounts into our helmet. Roll it down in front of the eye. Uh, we have a crosshair on here that allows us to look in the direction of our target, place the crosshairs on said target, and that's where the rounds uh, should strike. The helmet display unit provides the pilot flight and weapons symbology. This technology allows the pilot to focus on the mission and flying the Apache, rather than searching the aircraft for that information. Shoulder-launched missiles appeared on the battlefield in the 1970s. These missiles pose a growing threat to combat helicopters. The Apache was designed to minimize its vulnerabilities to these weapons. It is equipped with two engines so that if one is disabled, the aircraft can continue to fly. In addition, its engines are shrouded to reduce their heat signature, making it more difficult for heat-seeking missiles to track them. Electronic sensors warn the crew if radar-directed weapons are being aimed at them so that protection systems can be activated. These features are enhanced by the crew's tactics. Technology and tactics is exactly the combination we use. Uh, the Apache has improved technology as far as low infrared signature. Uh, we have uh, aircraft survivability equipment, ACE equipment on the aircraft, everything from radar jammers to IR jammers, uh, chaff and flare dispensers. Um, we have an APR-39, a radar warning system that allows me or tells me or tells the air crew uh, that somebody's looking at me or somebody's in acquisition or somebody's in track mode. Use all that technology and then you use the tactics of the uh, helicopter and Army helicopters are flying low, staying close to the terrain, using terrain to put the terrain between myself and an enemy force, using speed where appropriate or the opposite of that, using low speed where appropriate. So I don't go blundering into an enemy force. I use low speed, low altitude to find holes around an enemy defense and work my way around an area. The 1991 Gulf War witnessed the development of new tactics for helicopter warfare. One strategy implemented in the Gulf was the use of a combination of attack helicopters and scout helicopters. The smaller scout helicopters formed the eyes and ears of the team, the Apache, the muscle. The scouts look out for enemy missile teams while the Apache crew concentrated on targeting enemy positions. The scouts, armed with an air-to-air -air version of the Stinger missile, could also protect the attack helicopter unit from enemy helicopter attack. Apaches proved their value in several key Gulf battles, demonstrating the impact that a small force of helicopters could have in land war. Missile copters preceding the main tank attacks were able to break up Iraqi formations. Under a ceaseless barrage of deadly Hellfire missiles, the Iraqi armor units disintegrated. In 2002, Apaches were an essential element in helping to rid Afghanistan of Al-Qaeda and Taliban forces. The latest version of the Apache is the AH-64D Longbow Apache. Its name stems from the bulbous sensor mounted on top of the rotor assembly, which contains a millimeter wave radar. 
It's capable of scanning 360 degrees for threats in the air and 270 degrees for ground threats. Costing over $3 million, only one in three Longbow Apaches need to carry the expensive dome as the information from the sensors is shared among the battalion. Each Longbow Apache pilot receives data on digital multifunction displays, or MFDs. This radar expands the all-weather capabilities of Apache, even beyond FLIR sensors. It also permits the use of the latest generation of fire and forget Hellfire missiles. Such Hellfires do not need laser designation, but home in on the target using an onboard sensor. This combination of advanced technology and novel tactics has made the Apache attack helicopter one of the most potent weapons in modern land warfare. The Longbow flew its first mission in Operation Iraqi Freedom in early 2003 and has since logged thousands of combat hours in support of Allied troops. The success of attack helicopters like the Cobra and Apache has inspired similar helicopter programs around the world. One of these is South Africa's Rui Falk AH-2. Now with the advent of the Roy Falk, we can now improve on the flexibility of a helicopter and expand our concept of operations to provide firepower to the ground commander in the field. The design of the Roy Falk is intended as an anti-armor aircraft, but because of our circumstances in the Southern African scenario where we have low intensity conflicts, the aircraft has also been designed to fulfill other roles such as escort of transport helicopters and to a certain extent provide firepower for autonomous air force operations. The layout of the Rui Falk is the classical configuration with a two-man crew. One of the differences between the Rui Falk and the Apache is the cockpit layout. The Apache uses a single canopy, while on the Rui Falk, the canopy is split. The weapons officer sits in the front cockpit, and the pilot is seated in the station above and behind him. The pilot flies and navigates, while the co-pilot weapon system operator does the uh, management of the weapon system, the actual aiming, the firing, etc. He can operate the weapons independently, he can also fly the helicopter, should he be required to do this, because he has a full flying station, uh, full flight controls in the front cockpit as well. And in fact, the pilot can, should the need arise, also operate the weapon systems. The armament system of the AH-2 is similar to the Apaches. The Rui Falk can be fitted with traditional Hellfire or HOT missiles. Although the basic model of the Rui Falk is very similar in appearance to the Apache, there are several differences, many of them particularly suited for the African environment. Whereas the American systems are generally designed to be operated in a highly supportive environment with a lot of logistic support, our terrain and our environment has required of us to design it to be far less uh, dependent upon such support. It is better suited, we think, to operation over long distances. Another example would be the sand filter systems, which have been integrated in the design from day one, which is uniquely uh, suited to this type of dry, dusty environment. One of the areas where the Rui Falk incorporates new features is its avionics. The handling qualities of the basic aeroplane are very similar to um, the handling qualities that one would find on um, helicopters of this class. What we are developing for the Rofalk is a special electronic control system which will vastly improve the handling qualities of the aircraft in the low-level environment, which is the environment in which the aeroplane will spend most of its life. And this system will make the aircraft particularly well suited to easy piloting during operational sort the Rui Falk is the most sophisticated aircraft ever developed in Africa. 
the effort and cost that went into it is clear evidence of the helicopter's importance in contemporary military operations. Italy was the first in Western Europe to develop an attack helicopter. The A129 Mangusta. The Mangusta, or Mongoose, fits between the Cobra and Apache. It has the avionics and propulsion of current attack helicopters, but it is smaller and lighter than the Apache. During the 1990s, the Mangusta served in peacekeeping missions in Somalia and Albania. Throughout the 1990s, the Italians modified the Mangusta, culminating in the latest variant, the A129 CBT. The Mangusta CBT has superior avionics and weapon systems. It employs an innovative FLIR targeting system and advanced flight and fire controls. It can carry the tow and Hellfire anti-tank missile, as well as the Stinger air-to-air -air missile. It is also fitted with a 20 millimeter cannon and a three-barreled Gatling gun. The Tiger is the first attack helicopter program in Western Europe to rival the Apache in sophistication, size, and power. Its design and production is a cooperative effort between France and Germany. The Tiger is produced in three variants to satisfy the requirements of the two armed forces. The French HAC and German UHT are multi-role helicopters configured to provide air-to-air, air-to-ground, and anti-tank fire support. Similar to the Longbow, these variants feature a mast-mounted sight with infrared sensors and a laser rangefinder as well as a nose-mounted FLIR imager. Trigut and HOT missiles offer anti-tank capability. 68mm rocket supply air-to-ground fire support, while a 12.7mm gun pod and Stinger or Mistral missiles deliver air-to-air -air firepower. The third variant, the French HAP, is an escort helicopter specially built for air defense and fire support. The HAP features a nose-mounted 30-millimeter cannon. It has exceptionally low radar and infrared signatures. It also features superior avionics and state-of-the-art fire control systems. With their air superiority and awesome firepower, attack helicopters are increasingly essential on the modern battlefield. When a rapid reaction force is needed for today's high-speed maneuver warfare, the call goes out for the missile copter.